welcome to Tennessee This Week. It's good to be with you. Before we get started on talking about some of the issues, we want to introduce our panel of pundits. Courtney Piper, our political contributor, Craig Griffith, our health care analyst, and Michael Covington, our industrial consultant, all here and ready to discuss the important issues of Tennessee and East Tennessee. Let's start with the, the big one here. Tennessee Republican leadership uh, is laying the groundwork to potentially reject federal education dollars. I think it's $1.8 billion, close to $2 billion. Uh, federal funds typically make up about a tenth of the K through 12 budget. As one of the things I learned from it when I first heard that figure, I was like, oh, what percent is that? It's about 10%. Speaker of the House, uh, Cameron Sexton, Lieutenant Governor Rand McNally, announced Monday the creation of this new group of lawmakers to look into the feasibility of rejecting education funds. Before we get into our opinions about it, first things first is why would they even consider this? What would be the reason to to consider not taking those funds back? I mean, their taxes going out of Tennessee and money coming back. Craig? Well, that's the good question. You know, will people pay their taxes and not get the uh, benefit of paying those taxes and your in your uh, educational dollars. Uh, you know, uh, personally, I think it's all has to do with the, the culture wars. Uh, the the uh, supermajority in Nashville wants to do it with all strings, which means they'll be able to do what they want and things like bathroom laws and, uh, you know, transgender teaching issues. Uh, they'll also be free of strings from the ideas legislation that uh, helps uh, individuals with disabilities make it through school. Uh, and also, I think they're overlooking the issue that, it, yes, it's 10% of the state education budget, but when you break it down to the local level, some of the counties, the more rural counties, get much more than 10% of their budget uh, from uh, federal dollars. So, uh, and, and you contrast that with Memphis that gets like something like $896 million in federal uh, funds. So, I'm, you know, I'm not sure what they're trying to do other than do this, um, you know, culture war and education where they can call all the shots. But it does kind of make me mad. Uh, if you're telling me that you have $2 billion in your seat cushions, that you just all of a sudden come up with to replace that money, why haven't you addressed some of the issues that the state has? Uh, for instance, I have, I have a visual aid. Tennessee is has 898 structurally deficient bridges, which puts them in the nation and 40th in the nation in percent of structurally deficient bridges. Why wasn't some of this money, if it's just sitting there, going to help to fix that bridge problem? And there are just a host of other problems that they could address with that money. This is the Think Tennessee dashboard, uh, where Tennessee stands in relation to other states uh, in terms of specific issues. And some of the things like uh, Tennessee is 37th in infant mortality. It's 41st out of 50 in the power grid reliability sector, section. In poverty, it's 37th out of 50. And close to my heart, is adults with diabetes were 47th out of 50. Now, I, this is just one of, of 50 issues that they could have addressed with this money, but apparently it was just sitting there in the couch cushions. As I, So it kind of makes me mad that they can pick and choose what they want to do. And to me, it, they're ignore, ignoring problems that the state has had for years by not getting this money out the door and helping Tennesseans. I guess that begs the question, by doing this, did they just open that all up? Because you just, thank you for the visual aids, Craig, by the way, but you just came up with a whole list of things like that. So uh, Courtney or Michael, did they just open something up that they probably didn't mean to open up as well about how they're using funds? Oh, absolutely. If I was a new business that was recruited to come to the state of Tennessee, I would be beating down the state legislator's doors, asking them, where are they getting this money from? Because the answer is the franchise and excise tax, tax, which businesses pay. So to Craig's point, if the state has all this money lying around, why don't you cut the fr franchise and excise tax instead of 
putting the money towards education, which we get through federal funds. So, you know, if, if again, if I was a business, if I was a big legacy business that was in the state of Tennessee, if I was one of the hundreds of new businesses that this administration has recruited to the state of Tennessee, I'd be beating down the legislators' doors, asking them, you know, what the heck? Why wouldn't you reduce the franchise and excise tax, tax if you have all this money? Um, so that's point one. But I do want to bring it back to something else that Craig mentioned, which is the IDEA Act or the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Mm -hmm. This federal law requires and gives the right to children with disabilities to have a free and appropriate public education. If we reject those federal funds, it puts our kids with disabilities in jeopardy. They might not have that right. So in Knox County, there are 8,500 students that fall under the IDEA Act. What's going to happen to them? Are we going to leave them behind? These are critical questions that need to be asked of every single person on that committee. And, and, and I'm not throwing water on anything. I mean, what you're saying there's also possibility that they'd all be taken care of as well. There's nothing saying that that's the first place they would cut. But actually, you're actually Don, I am glad that you brought this up. We already know that the state special education, that school district special education departments are underfunded, under-resourced, and understaffed. So if you're going to be taking away money that we get from the federal government and saying, well, we can replace that on a one-to-one -one ratio with state money, it doesn't put us in any better of a position. In fact, the state does scorecards on each individual school district special education departments, and Knox County, along with a host of other co counties, are consistently rated as not satisfactory and not meeting state benchmarks for special education. Well, again, uh, Speaker Sexton said this was to free schools from federal rules and regulations and make them independent from the federal government's choices. Michael, your take on all this. Uh, Don, this is about strings and power. Um, the federal government allots you X number of dollars, but they give it to you as though it's an allowance that they can control how you spend it. Um, I'm understanding that the state legislature, the supermajority state legislature, does not want the federal government to be able to have a say in how they spend that $2 billion. So rather than accept it and have the federal government then come in and say, we don't like how you spent that money. They would rather forego that money and control their own destiny. Now, here's the here's the here's the rub. That's two billion dollars. That is, as Greg and Courtney eloquently put it, that that money could be utilized in other ways. The question then becomes: Will the federal government have some issue with the way that money is spent? So we work our way all the way back around to the state legislature wanting to have control over federal funds that come in. And if they don't, they'd rather give those funds back and control the, the destiny of the citizens of the state of Tennessee. Well, and the risk of doing that is you have tens of thousands of children across the state of Tennessee that will be left behind because they their rights under a federal law will be in jeopardy. Children with disabilities are guaranteed the right to a free and appropriate public education mm -hmm. for the purpose of making sure their lives are su as successful as possible and as independent as possible. And if we reject those federal funds and along with it, the federal law that guarantee our children with disabilities those protections, our children are at risk. And that's a very hypocritical position for our state to be in. So and let me point out that we rejected the federal funds that it came along with Obamacare. We did not expand uh, uh, our ten care, which is the Tennessee Medicaid program. And what the result of that is that uh, Tennessee is forty third out of the fifty states in number of uninsured individuals. So there are consequences. Uh, not wanting to have all these federal strings. Uh, you have to have the, you, you may have consequences like that uh, in, in the healthcare industry. Well, $2 billion is, is, is a great place to start in terms of divvying up funds. But just my, my fellow pundits, one is interested in special needs children, and one is interested in securing some bridges that probably really need some attention. Where does, where does the majority of that money go? And what do we do when the discussion comes up about, let's put some money in something else? The question, again, always is going to come back to who gets to control that money? 
And what's that money going to be used for? And will we be able to accept the federal government telling us, no, we don't want you to use that money for that purpose? And I'll also, also say that there is a pushback on the local level from state regulators as well. It's not like the state is going to give this money just, you know, you know, here, Knox County, here's a, a bag full of a million dollars. Use it how you want. They're going to develop strings. They're going to develop program mm -hmm. parameters. I'm sure, Michael, you know that from the, the work that you do on economic development. It, it all comes with strings. It just sure depends it on where the strings come from. Just real real quickly, yes or no, they have to look at this issue. They're saying they'd have a decision whether or not they're going to do it by January. Will they actually not take the money, yes or no? Years of, of studying it, they'll, they'll, they'll reject the federal money, just like they did in healthcare. I do not want them to reject it. It would be... It would be horrible for the state, and I don't know how we could continue these economic gains when we're recruiting people, companies to the state, and saying, hey, the public education system where you might be sending your children, we reject federal funding for it. I would implore the, the state legislature to find a compromise, to find a way that they can satisfy, satisfy some of the needs that both Craig and Courtney have talked about. I, I like the idea of bridges being secured. I like the idea of special need kids being able to have a fair shake at the best possible education and life they can have. And I don't like that the idea that it's politicized. All right, we need to cut everyone off here and move on. By the way, that's uh, five points for all the things that you had to say and minus five for not answering yes or no on that question. We're going to take a break and be right back. Welcome back to Tennessee This Week. We were talking about maybe foregoing some money. Now we're going to talk about the state spending some money, $415 million to be exact, give or take. Uh, groundbreaking for a new multi-agency law enforcement training academy. Maletta is the acronym that they're using right now in Nashville. Just so everyone knows, this is going to be a state-of-the-art facility, training facility for state and local law enforcement. They'll be able to have uh, some training going on where they can stay and be housed uh, there while they're doing that. It'll also be the headquarters for the Department of Corrections, State Department of Safety and Homeland Security. Crime is obviously a big issue uh, here in Tennessee. But is this the right move to set up something in Nashville for this kind of training and for that kind of money, $415 million? We started with Craig last time. Let's start with Courtney this time. It sounds like a really great idea and a really great facility. State of the art costs money. And, you know, the cost of construction has gone up considerably, considerably in the last three years. So, you know, if you're looking at over $400 million in 2023 money, um, I bet that would have been significantly cheaper if it was built three years ago. But, you know, state-of-the-art facilities have big price tags, and I haven't read into a whole lot about it, but the theory and the concept seems like a very, very valid thing. Michael? We're just a, we're just a few years from uh, several states, several major metropolitan areas, trying to curb uh, funding for law enforcement. And I think it's been a problem. Well, I know it's been a problem here in Knoxville. We've, we're short several officers. and They, they may be catching up, but, but uh, for several years, we were 40, 50 officers short of what we really needed to, to protect and serve the citizens of the city of Knoxville. I think it's a good idea to invest in law enforcement. It sends a message to young people graduating from college and young people who are interested in a law enforcement career. It, it shows that Tennessee is committed. Tennessee wants strong law enforcement on the street protecting the citizens, and I think it will help all of our municipalities to uh, to satisfy their law enforcement needs. Training is paramount in law, in law enforcement. You, you need good training for all your officers. Fortunately, in Knoxville, the city of Knoxville has an excellent training academy for their, their new police officers. But the smaller communities and counties in the state don't have that luxury. They need somewhere to train their their new recruits and to bring old officers back for continuing training. One of the things that happens when you get sued over a, a, a police enforcement issue, and I'm sure Don knows this as a former police officer, the they always look at the training you received. Uh, did you follow the training that you got in 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 this particular episode? So training is just very important to to make sure that the counties stay safe and the people stay safe. And I hope it encourages more people to uh, to come into the field of law enforcement because they're needed all across the state. 
Uh, and since you brought it up, Craig, yeah, when I was going through the academy and getting post certified, we were having a classes on the kind of like the west end of a campus and running into students all the time uh, in the evening during that. It wasn't a facility just for us. It was part of, part of a school campus. I'm curious, does this maybe help recruit like colleges that build bigger, you know, weight rooms and better stuff for the students when you bring someone in there and say, this is where you're going to be training. Do you think that this can actually make, make a difference, not in just the training, but also the recruiting? Well, I'm not so sure that Hancock County and Morgan County and uh, they're going to, they're going to tout their training facility in Nashville. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important that, you know, it's, that you can tell a new recruit, you will be adequately trained in all of law enforcement. So, but I, I don't know that it's going to help the, the smaller counties across the state. Well, I guess uh, that's what I mean, because these small counties don't have much to offer sometimes. Instead of say, hey, we're sending you here to this place to get trained will have an impact. Chef Tom Spangler has talked about uh, some of the assets that will enable him to, to uh, do a better job of recruiting sheriff's deputies to Knox County. The same would be true for the city of Knoxville. And I like to think that the smaller counties that that um, have more land and more space, uh, but maybe not uh, uh, as municipal, I think that there'll be uh, an opportunity for those municipalities to recruit from this same facility as well. And, and just so people know, there there were a lot of detractors. I, I saw on Twitter, a lot of people calling it another cop city and a lot of money uh, that could have been spent on other things. Uh, and so I go back again, if that would maybe best use of $400 million of all the th issues that we're facing in the state, that's certainly getting a lot of attention. Well, Don, you should probably stay off Twitter. It's X. 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 <laughs> Whatever. Platform formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> that's true. And that, that's a valid point, $400 yeah. million. I'm, I'm sure that's one of the larger construction projects in the, in the state. So uh, it, 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 is, you know, it is a chunk of tea, but not knowing the, the programming of the facility and things like that, it's hard to comment on the cost. Right. I mean, I, I don't think this is just a brick and mortar facility. I'm going to assume that there's a lot of technology in here. Right. Um, again, because there are other sorts of offices that are going to require technology. If they're training officers, it's going to, you know, there's just a lot of technology and construction costs have gone up. So I'm not necessarily going to comment on the entire price tag because, you know, just knowing the little that I know about construction, what you put into that building, it it can add up. So until I see a line by line item budget, I can't really comment on if that cost is exorbitant or not. All right. So we now know Courtney's not putting on a hard hat and laying brick anytime soon. At least we don't think so. We're going to take a break. and We'll be right back. Welcome back to Tennessee this week. Uh, Daniel Herrera, the former Knox County GOP chair, uh, says that he's going to challenge the incumbent Republican Knox County law director, David Buke, in the 2024 election. Herrera was elected to the county GOP in 21. Um, Buke has been in that chair position since 2020, I believe, after being the uh, chief deputy for about eight years. Both of them have talked to Knox News and uh, as far as Herrera goes, he's just saying that uh, Knox County needs a director who will support the will of the people. Buke saying that experience counts and Knox County needs experienced representation. Uh, for a lot of people, this was a surprise. Where do you think this is headed? And we've started with Craig and Courtney, so we'll start with Michael this time. Well, I, I can recall when primary became a verb. Uh, to primary. Uh, for, for the longest time in politics, a primary was a noun. It was a thing that happened. Um, now, to primary means to be an incumbent who has a primary opponent that you would not necessarily have anticipated having. I was a little surprised to see that Daniel Herrera was running against uh, David Buch in the uh, upcoming primary for the law director seat. Um, it should be interesting, in part because uh, David Book has a universe of supporters. Daniel Herrera has a universe of supporters. And a significant part of their support base overlaps. 
So I'm curious as to how this this race will will unfold, and and I'm also curious to see if Daniel can actually give David Book a run for his money. Yeah, I I wouldn't say that it was all roses either. No. I think that you know he uh, attempted to run a slate of Republicans in the nonpartisan city races, uh, city council races two years ago, and everyone that they promoted lost by a health, healthy margin. Right. Uh, and then there was the whole issue of a company he was working for was getting uh, county GOP money to help run uh, campaigns of certain uh, uh, Republicans in the primary uh, that were running against other Republicans. And that would seem like a, a severe ethical violation to me. Uh, it was like, let's recycle this money. So in the end, I get it. And then um, also, uh, I think we need to remember that David Boot had a fairly challenging um, primary opponent last time in Kathy Quist. Uh, now Shanks. I can't remember. Shanks. 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 Yeah, uh, who was a uh, a longtime office holder in Knoxville and was well known, and uh, David beat her in a fairly close race. So David's used to tight races. I, I think that he has um, much more of a solid base than Daniel does because of the amount of time he's been in Knox County. And so, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, I've always said, you know, there shouldn't always be opposition in any political race. Uh, so all the issues get aired. And I, I guess we're going to have that in the county law director race in a couple of years. It's, it, it is very uncommon for an incumbent to be challenged by the former chair of your county party. So just, you know, let that sink in for a second. Um, I'm really going to be interested to see what Herrera's platform is going to look like. Uh, Buke and the law department came under fire from the special education task force. We were very critical of how the law department made decisions about pursuing legal cases against Knox County citizens and parents. So um, I'm sort of interested to see when Herrera says that people want a real, true conservative representing them, how that would differ from David Book and, you know, what's going to differentiate them. But in any, at any rate, this will be interesting. It will get spicy for the very reason that you have a former party chair who is challenging an incum an, the incumbent of his same party. So, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sit down and grab my popcorn and see how this unfolds. Well, and there's no certainty that, that it will stay at just two candidates. It, there may be a third candidate. Um, as Craig was saying, uh, that, that primary race with Kathy Quist Shanks and David Book was fairly close. Now you've got a third candidate in that race. Uh, so, a, so a third candidate could materialize, and it could be spicier, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would think a third candidate would make it less spicy because we we would call that the Stacey Camfield effect for those people that remember Stacey Camfield. Who? Um, when yeah, I, exactly um, <laughs> when we used to think that he, you know, he was causing problems in the Tennessee General Assembly with some of his antics, but he would, you know, whenever he would run, people would think, oh, we've got a chance. He would get primaried, and that, you know, there would be a challenger in the in the general election. And the the political lore is that he would recruit people to run in that primary to run as independents because the more people that were running for that seat the right. increased likelihood that he was going to win it. So, yeah, if Herrera recruits another candidate, um, if Book recruits another candidate, it's going to favor the in incumbent, and then maybe it gets a little less spicy. And even if they don't recruit someone, is this could you see someone eyeing that and go, okay, those two are going to split it up. I'm going to jump in there because it's just great opportunity to maybe win an election that you wouldn't have won if you were just going right up against uh, the incumbent. That could absolutely happen. So it's difficult to recruit real high quality candidates for these positions, especially in in law, because you're asking someone to step out of their profession for four to eight years at a period when they're in their peak earning power. Right. So it's, you know, will will there be someone? Heaven only knows. We'll just have to wait and see. Okay. 
Well, we're, with that, we're going to wrap things up here. Thank you to all of you for taking part in this and sharing your opinions, which you so easily do. And a special thanks to Craig for bringing visual aids. He gets bonus My points. pleasure. <laughs> Always appreciated. All right, Michael, Courtney, Craig, thank you very much. We'll see you next week on Tennessee This Week. The views of guests on Tennessee This Week are their own and do not represent the views of WATE6 on your side or Next Star Broadcasting.